Welcome, everyone. My name is Nick Blesky, and I work for our Utah State University Extension Integrated Pest Management Program. And I am the one that's been conducting these vegetable IPM winter webinar series. This year's series has been geared towards Utah's commercial farmers, small urban farmers, but we have a lot of great information for everyone, including home gardeners as well. So tonight's webinar, we are gonna specifically cover common diseases and insect pests of potato crops. So as a quick reminder, you guys are watching this as a Zoom webinar, so you will not have access to the camera or microphone on your computer. However, we want you guys to leave comments and questions in our Zoom chat box so we can answer those. And this webinar is going to be recorded and it will be available on our USU Extension um, YouTube channel and our USU Extension Utah Pest website for later viewing. If you have requested a pesticide use CEU, there will be questions at the end of this webinar for you that you will answer and you will submit that to the Utah Department of Ag and Food for your certificate. And I'll explain more about that at the end. But now I'm gonna introduce our guest tonight. We have Dr. Jeff Miller. Um, he earned his bachelor degree in botany biotechnology from Brigham Young University and his master's and doctorate degree in plant pathology from Washington State University. He is currently the CEO and president of Miller Research in Rupert, Idaho, where they conduct re residue and efficacy research on pesticide for commercial chemical companies. In addition, they perform contract research for agricultural production groups such as the Idaho Potato Commission and the Snake River Sugar Association. Dr. Miller is well known in the potato industry, so we are beyond blessed to have him speak to our growers tonight. Okay, thanks. I appreciate the introduction, Nick. I think something where they say that, let's see. Let's see. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Nick invited me to come talk about uh, common pests of potatoes, uh, specifically diseases. And as we go, I'd be more than happy to entertain questions along the way. So if I'm talking about something that you want to learn more about or I haven't explained it well, please uh, interrupt me or Nick, you interrupt me and we'll make sure that we, we answer those questions as we go. I think that's better than, than waiting until the very end because I there's, you know, in 30 minutes, there's no way for me to cover um, everything I'd like to talk about. Besides, I'm sure you don't want to be bored for me to keep running on and on. So I, I may kind of skim over some things, but um, so if I get to a, a spot where you want me to stop and talk more, I would uh, be happy to do that. I do want to tell you a bit about Miller Research. We uh, were officially established in 1977. We're located here in Southern Idaho um, in the Rupert Burley area, and we do uh, contract research for companies, but we also do our own that um, our own ideas that we get funded usually through the grower groups. And as Nick mentioned, we work with the potato growers. Um, we have worked with the sugar beet growers a little bit. And our goal, at least our mission statement, is to provide sound scientific information for agriculture. So we test a lot of things for companies to see how well different products work. And a lot of times this is done before these products are labeled to be used in the industry. We also do work on um, what they call GLP or good laboratory practice type trials. And these are conducted to determine what type of uh, chemical residues are present in the food. And companies use these in order to get a registration to the EPA for a different fungicides. And uh, we're, we're one small cog in a big machinery that uh, generates um, labeling information along that way. You can find us, we have uh, information. I have a Facebook page, Miller Research LLC. I also uh, share some information on Twitter and LinkedIn. And I have an email group that um, where I share information related to potato pest management. Um, if you're interested in that, um, I know it says the Idaho Potato Pest Resource, but uh, if any of you here in the state of Utah want to be a part of that, I'd be happy to add you. You can send me an email and I'll make sure that gets you on the list. And we have a website at uh, millerresearch.com and we put up some of our uh, talks which are publicly available. We also have a gallery of different diseases, different photos and some information about disease management there. So those are places you can find out more or reach us, reach me if you have any additional questions. Before I, I start, I wanna talk about the disease triangle because this is a, one of the best ways to conceptualize 
um, when disease will occur. You really have to have three things that happen. You have to have a host, which uh, you know we have the potato. Uh, the beginning question that Nick asked, what's your favorite potato? Um, you know, I, I kind of sat there and I vacillated between several. Uh, the russet narcota is a beautiful potato. It, uh, and I love it because it's susceptible to just about every disease that, um, that we have in potatoes. So from someone who wants to, wants to see disease and then try to manage it, narcota is a good one. But then again, there are others uh, like the ranger russet, which is fairly resistant to some diseases. And it's nice because if you're growing that, say, for a, a processing contract, it has a lot more, um, a lot better qualities. I, I picked for the pathogen, the, the second leg of this triangle, I picked Verticillium dallii. It is a fungus that lives in the soil. It's very, very common. Um, we have it just to, probably just about everywhere in the United States. You get the, the, the host, the pathogen together. Then if you have the right environment, then you can get disease. So when all three of those things are together, um, in this case, we get Verticillium wilt, and you have to have all three. So when we talk about managing diseases, uh, sometimes we're talking about trying to modulate the environment. Um, sometimes we're talking about trying to increase the resistance of the host. And other times we're just flat out trying to kill the pathogen. We're trying to eliminate those so that we don't have, um, we, at least we, we minimize one leg of that triangle. Now there's a book out there that uh, for any of you who want to, to know more about potato diseases, produced by the American Phytopathological Society or the APS Press called Compendium of Potato Diseases. Um, and in there, they outline the different diseases that are, are found throughout the world. And unfortunately, you know, here in the, the Western United States, there are many that we don't see, but um, there's five that are bacterial, 30 fungi caused by fungi, six by plant parasitic nematodes, um, three by phytoplasmas. The, the compendium really only lists two, but there's been a, a new one found since and went to press, we have 12 viruses or viroids, one that's simply the result of an insect toxin, and then 26 different physiological disorders and injuries. So you can tell if we wanted to talk about all these tonight, um, we wouldn't get through it. We could only spend probably a few seconds on each one. That wouldn't do them justice. So I've tried to single out some that I thought were the best. Before that, I want to talk about seed certification. Um, because this is really one of the first ways that we manage many of the potato diseases that we have. Three in particular have a zero tolerance um, in, in almost all seed certification systems. And those are bacterial ring rot. And that's shown right here. Uh, the corky root, or sorry, the root knot nematode. Now this potato here, the, the picture, I, I probably should have tried to find a different one. When the root knot nematode attacks potatoes, the, it will, the nematode will actually burrow into the skin and it will form these small bumps. And there's a zero tolerance for that in seed. And then we have corky ring spot, which is a virus, tobacco rattle virus, and it's vectored by a nematode, which is the stubby root nematode. So when potatoes get, get a, a val when seed potatoes get certified, um, they actually go through five different evaluations through the season. If any of these three diseases are found, that seed uh, becomes decertified and it can't be sold. Um, so this is the, really the first line of defense for, keep, for managing some diseases. Um, in fact, I would say for bacterial ring rot and corky ring spot, it is, it is really the best way that we can manage some of these diseases. Seed certification also targets some other diseases. In particular, um, blackleg is one that um, we don't see very often in um, potato production. And, and a lot of that has been due to seed certification because it, we've been able to pull a seed out that carries the bacteria that causes this. And so that has gone down um, dramatically. Potato virus Y is another one, uh, mosaic viruses, that there is a tolerance present. And um, so in other words, the seed can have a certain amount. And that's largely because it is proven difficult, if not impossible, to get rid of PDY. Uh, there are different strains of PDY that are present around the United States. And one that's really most common here in, um, in the Western US is what they call um, N. Wilga. And, um, as you know, as, as each seed generation gets, gets higher and higher, or mean that it's been in the field longer and longer, um, the tolerance goes up. So there, you can get some virus in the seed. Um, PBY can be very damaging in the cert on certain varieties. And um, that's one reason it's still around. Some varieties can be infected and they won't show any symptoms. But really the best way to manage PBY is through seed, buying clean seed. 
Late blight also is an important one that we've been able to manage through seed and as is potato leaf roll virus. In fact, I would say that potato leaf roll virus is, is it has almost disappeared completely. And that's largely through the efforts of seed certification. Late blight back in the 90s, late 80s and 90s, late blight became a, a huge problem in the United States and uh, efforts were made to, um, to eliminate it through seed. The problem is there is a tolerance for it. And so if you figure, I try to do this map ahead of time because I knew I wouldn't be able to do it on the spot. But if I'm gonna plant say uh, 2200 weight per acre um, potato seed and my average seed piece is two and a half ounces, if I were to allow one per, uh, we have 1% of the seed to have late blight, that would be 140 seed pieces. So you can see that's quite a bit and it's difficult to find um, late blight when it's present at that level. Um, so even if we had a lower tolerance, there still might be some seed that gets through. So we do rely on other methods to manage late blight, but the seed certification has helped in that. Um, quarantines have also been highly effective. Um, some of you, if you're in the potato world, you've probably heard about um, the, back in 2006, what was essentially a, a, a huge catastrophe for the Idaho potato industry when the Pell cyst nematode was found. It's over in Newfoundland, it's Globodera pallida, and it's, it just, you know, they have it in Europe, but we just didn't have it in Idaho. There was the golden nematode, which is somewhat similar, and they had that back in um, Eastern Canada, and it has been in New York since 1941. And in New York, they have a very strict program um, trying to manage the golden nematode. So when it was found in Idaho, there was a strict quarantine put in place wherever this was found, and those, those places could not be used for potato production. Um, there's been a lot of work done trying to totally eliminate those fields that have it. And it, is, it looks like it's being successful, but you would never wanna see, if you had a potato crop, you would never wanna see these small round um, galls. They, they look like, um, these are the cysts. They're, they're not nitrogen fixing nodules because the potato, potatoes do that. Um, they also look quite different than say powdery scab not, uh, galls that can form in the roots, but this is what the nematode looks like on the outside of potato roots. Hopefully we never see that. Eradication is another important way that we can get rid of potato diseases. It's, it's critical as we deal with potatoes that we destroy any disease material. Um, now sometimes these can hold, can um, hang around like in potato coal piles. This is a shot that was taken here in Southern Idaho. There's a wheat field and this big pile of dirt down here. All of these, this greenery you see are potatoes. This is a field that uh, was taken out of potatoes. Um, I believe they were going to plant uh, seed, onions for seed, and that usually goes in in um, July. And before that, we had all these potato plants um, that were growing out here in the field. And this actually was a year following a year we had late blight. And so we worry that volunteers or coal piles, they can be a source for late blight to survive from one year to the next. They can also be a reservoir for viruses and insects. So we have to get rid of these things. Um, in fact, there's laws in place in Idaho that, that, that say the coal piles have to be destroyed. And uh, we strongly encourage growers to make sure they get rid of volunteers. But that can sometimes be a, a, a tall order, um, depending on the winter that we have. Uh, equipment sanitation is important. Um, it's suspected, I'm going back to the nematode issue, the, this pale cyst nematode, it's suspected that the way it got to those fields was through the movement on contaminated equipment. And we can do some fumigation. That's what they've done to try to get rid of the pelsis nematode. Um, but it's, that's not always a, a, a foolproof method and sometimes there are problems with using that. So sanitation is also important. Um, you, you can do everything you can maybe to, to clean up your facilities, clean up your trucks. But let, let, let's say you, you've cleaned everything and then you go and get a load of potatoes from someone and it's carrying certain diseases. Then you have the chance to bring those diseases with you to your farm. So, um, when you're handling loads of potatoes and you're switching say from one seed lot to another, it's important that you, you sanitize or sterilize the surfaces that touch those potatoes. And uh, there's a bulletin that the University of Idaho has put out. It's uh, the CIS or Current Information Series 1180 and it's called Cleaning and Disinfecting Potato Equipment and Storage Facilities. I highly recommend it. It gives a lot of good information there, especially about managing say for uh, ring rot and bacterial soft rot and some others. I also want to emphasize the role of proper fertility and irrigation. You know, for the remainder of the time here, the, the next 15 minutes that I've got, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about pesticides. 
because when we talk about disease management uh, programs, a, a lot of times you'll read this, this laundry list of management, management um, methods or tools and growers are doing a lot of those a lot of times. Oftentimes the things you, you have the greatest choice over would be which pesticide that you might use. But o overlaying all of that is proper fertility and proper irrigation. Um, if we have a crop that isn't fertilized to where it, uh, what we might call the optimal fertilization, then we run the risk of increasing the severity of certain diseases like verticillium wilt and then the foliar disease, early blight and brown spot. Those are both somewhat related and I'll, I'll mention those in a few minutes. But, um, you know, especially keeping the nitrogen in the desired range is, is judged by petiole tests or soil testing, also potassium and phosphorus. If those are kept in the desired range, that can actually go a long ways to uh, minimizing um, verticillium and also early blight. If we over irrigate, and it, you know, talking about irrigation is often about like talking about someone's family. When um, you tell them they're doing it wrong, it's, it's almost like you're offending them. In fact, I have this joke that if you ask um, every, if you were to ask any farmer, especially in Idaho, uh, do you over irrigate? Almost every one of them would say, no, I do not, but my neighbor does. In fact, once we asked them, we uh, did a quiz with some consultants, we asked them, how many of you feel like you irrigate on the heavy side? About 75% of them said that they do, because the risk of under irrigating, um, that risk is greater because it will damage the crop uh, more readily than, say, over irrigating. But when we over irrigate, we increase the risk of diseases like pink rot, pythium leak, aerial stem rot, bacterial soft rot, and white mold. So we have several seedborne diseases, and we mentioned the viruses. We talked about how to manage those through a certification. Uh, Fusarium dry rot, also Rhizoctonia canker and black scurf, silver scurf, late blight, and powdery scab. These are all diseases that can, they're not, they're not the only seedborne diseases, but these are the ones that we tend to see that are most common. And um, there are things that we can do as we manage the seed. And I want to focus on Fusarium dry rot uh, first. It'll be one of the few diseases that I highlight today because it is so common. You, if you buy seed that's, in, that's infested or infected with Fusarium and you plant that, um, the seed peas can decay or start to decay. And this plant is actually stunted. If I had another normal one next to it, you'd see it be almost twice as tall. And then when you harvest and you wound the potatoes, the risk is for them to become infected. Uh, dry rot develops rather quickly, especially when the tubers, the, the pulp temperatures are around 60 to 70 degrees. And that's often where they're at when we're harvesting. And then if that's a seed crop, that can just perpetuate the disease cycle. The fusarium fungi also live in the soil. And so to prevent it, um, we recommend that you purchase seed with as little dry rot as possible. Um, dry rot is not on the uh, certification list, so it's not something that they score. Now, if, if there are infected tubers, it will go towards, say, a total rot. Um, but dry rot itself isn't specifically named. You can sterilize seed cutting equipment um, between lots, sharpening cutting knives. We found that when you cut seed with a dull knife, um, it takes longer for that cut surface to heal and it makes the potato more uh, susceptible to dry rot. Um, Pre-cutting, very common practice, and it, there's a lot of benefits to pre-cutting. Uh, so I probably should change this. Um, my better say, if you pre-cut, just realize that your risk of fusarium dry rot is higher than if you just cut and plant directly. We do have several effective seed treatments. I already mentioned minimize wounding at harvest. And in some cases, we can spray stadium as a post-harvest treatment as the potatoes come out of the ground, and that can minimize some of the decay. When it comes to seed piece treatments, um, it used to be that a lot of growers just use some type of bark, either alder bark or fir bark. And we found this is the, the percent of decayed pieces. We found that these bark, the, the, go, the goal of the bark is to help that cut surface heal, but they are not fungicidal in nature. And so these bark seed piece treatments, they don't control fusarium. You have to use something that has a fungicide in it, like a Maxim MZ. And when we do that, we get great control of the disease. Another important thing to point out is that um, when we looked at inferral applications of fungicides like Quadris, Quadris is, is very popular when it comes to uh, managing rhizoctonia. And so as an inferral spray at 8.7 fluid ounces has no effect whatsoever on fusarium dry rot. So the inferral spray, you're just not getting enough product on that seed treatment. If you wanna protect the seed from, um, from dry rot, you need to use a fungicide like there's Maxim MZ, Moncode MZ, um, and there are liquid offerings of Maxim. These really aren't too available much anymore. They've, uh, I guess you 
I could say upgraded them. Now Syngenta has what they call the Cruiser Max line, and I'll mention those in a minute. Uh, talk more about them. But um, so in summary, with Fusarium, C treatment products, um, especially if you're combined with Mancozeb, they offer the best protection against Fusarium C beast decay. Bark only is not effective, and neither are inferral fungicides. Now. We've used makers of dust for a long, long time. It's been very effective, but there's a push to get rid of the dust, uh, primarily over worker safety. And so there are new liquid offerings out there. Bayer has, has produced uh, Emesto Silver. Um, Syngenta has their Cruiser Max. Um, you know, the Cruiser is their insecticide mixed with Maxim, and then they have other fungicides mixed in there. There is a liquid Mancozeb treatment out. Um, by UPL and it's called Startup MANZB. And we've looked at that and it is uh, effective. So some of these liquid seed treatments may offer some answers there um, to help us get rid of the dust. Another disease that's important to talk about is Rhizoctonium. And a lot of times we can manage Rhizoctonium fusarium the same way. If you look at the stems and they're, they're not white, but they have these, these dark brown discolorations um, you can see sometimes the stolen will get cut off. And so the potato that's growing on the end of there will, will not get any yield. And it will also produce this scurf appearance, um, this black scurf. It looks like dirt that won't wash off. If you go to the, my wife gives me a hard time. Every time we go to the grocery store, I go in over and I look and see, do we have any of this? And quite often we do in a lot of potatoes, especially if you're looking at a light skin variety. Um, the other answer I was going to give the next question was the Yukon Gold. I love to eat Yukon Golds, but they are also highly susceptible to Rhizoc, and a lot of times we will see them have at least some Rhizoc on them. It can affect stand. This is a shot of uh, some plots that we inoculated with the Rhizoctonia fungus, and um, where we had fungicides that had some activity, we had good stands in the check, and say a product that did not work, um, we see that there is a, a reduction stand. There are a lot of different uh, fungicides out there that work. We have found for us in our, that the inferral fungicides are more effective, um, say, than the seed treatments. And when it comes to cost, too, there's a, a benefit here. Uh, Quadras, which has been around for a long time, and even now we have some generic versions of this. This costs our growers, at least in southern Idaho, somewhere around $12 to $13 an acre, which is pretty good because some of these seed piece treatments can cost upwards to $30. $30 on a per acre basis. You see there's a lot of them. There's those that have flutioxanil. Um, there are several different formulations here. Um, then you have Syngenta where they combine a, a, another active ingredient, diphenoconazole. Um, now diphenoconazole plus sedaxine, and this is the product that, they, that they're marketing most heavily in potatoes. Bayer has the, the penfluven plus prothioconazole, which is a mesto silver. And it is also a, an effective product. But we found that these sprays in furl, um, they can be very good for managing rhizoctonia, maybe more so than um, what we would see with the seed treatments. So, I don't know, I, I, is, do I, am I seeing some questions here, Nick, or there's... Yeah, uh, so Julie wants to know if potatoes with black scurf, I think she means the silver scurf, are those edible? Oh, yeah, well, it's a great question. And actually we could answer for both of those diseases. I'm not gonna talk about silver scurf. Silver scurf does not produce those blacks, but it will actually give the potato kind of a grayish, um, silvery sheen. And uh, the potatoes are totally edible. The fungus does not hurt you at all. It doesn't harm you in any way. Um, it actually, the Rhizoctonia is a basidiomycete, which is the same class of fungi as our, most of our mushrooms that we eat. So they don't hurt it at all. And uh, yeah, you, as someone else said, yeah, you can peel it off. Um, but yeah, I, I, eat, I love to eat the skin and I don't care if there's black sugar on it at all. That's actually one disease that it, I will say this, the, the Rhizoctonia in the soil can affect the yield or the, sorry, the grade, the, um, the grade of the potatoes. You tend to get larger, more misshapen tubers if you don't manage rhizoctonia. So that's really the reason that we go after it. We do hope to get rid of that black scurf. And, and usually we see it. if we reduce it in the, in the stems, it will reduce on the tubers, um, but it doesn't hurt you. So that's a, that's a really good question. I'm going to skip through that part. So foliar diseases, um, there's quite a few. Late blight seems to get um, all the attention, but quite honestly, in the Western US, late blight is not a huge factor. This is what caused the Irish potato famine. And for all of us that have Irish ancestors that came to the United States back in the late 1800s, it was likely because late blight drove them out. If this is a potato field that's supposed to look green all the way through. It's not supposed to have um, these brown spots in there. And if we look a little closer, 
back here you see this just kind of this grayish area if we get up close all the leaves are dead and up close you see these lesions that are, are brownish with a light halo around it that is late blight um, it does rear its head from time to time um, the last time we had it was 2019 here in southern idaho but it's, it's because it's so dry here in the west it doesn't really spread like it does in the east and in the midwest and uh, but the, it's the one reason it's so bad is two weeks later the field will look like this and so this disease has the potential to take the plants out really quick. There's a lot of things that you can do. We already talked about destroying coal piles. I will say this for, um, if you ever see a tomato plant in a store that looks like it's dying and has a lesion like late blight, that's very, very possible. There have been, um, scientists have been able to trace the outbreaks of certain epidemics to the movement of infected tomatoes through some of these, these larger box stores. Uh, and it's, it's actually been a very difficult thing to get a handle on because in many cases, the stores don't own the tomato plants, but they're selling them by consignment. So you know, they don't have the, the authority to just get rid of them. Um, you can treat seed with an effective, seed, uh, effective fungicide. And as we mentioned, Mancozeb is highly effective against late blight. Scouring the fields is very important and watching the weather, um, using an effective fungicide program. And I'll, I'll mention some things about that in a minute. Um, also make sure our vines are dead prior to harvest. Once the vines die, the pathogen dies. And so that stops, that is a source for the, the spores getting in the soil and working their way down affecting the tubers. You can apply fungicides as a soil barrier towards the end of the season and also a, a post-harvest spray of a phosphite would also help. We have a lot of fungicides that are effective against late blight. And actually late blight is pretty easy to control. It's expensive, unfortunately. It, it oftentimes under wet conditions requires a lot of spraying. But I like to use the example of sunscreen. Um, I'm redhead, at least I was when I still had hair and a fairly fair skinned. And if I even thought about going outside, I'd get sunburned. And so, um, you know, actually, if I go outside, I start to get, a, and I start to feel that my nose is maybe a little tender and think I better start put on some sunscreen, it's too late. And it's the same way with managing some of these foliar diseases like late blight and also early blight and white mold. If we wait until we see them, um, we've waited too long. You know, IPM is really important, but when it comes to managing these foliar diseases, it's better to be ahead of the game and do it preventatively rather than curatively. So we have uh, protected fungicides like, uh, you know, the Bravo, th Bravo formulations are, that are uh, chlorothalonil, um, Mancozeb, this is like diethane. There are some other products there. There are many that have what you would call high activity. And uh, some of these are really, really good. Um, we found testing these that they just, they pretty much shut the late blight down its tracks and it doesn't go anywhere. And so they're, they're very effective. Um, there are many that are not recommended for late blight. And I want to put this slide up here just to, to emphasize that a lot of these, like the Luna Tranquility and the Endura, and now the Meridus and the Prolosol, these are the best fungicides for managing early blight, early blight and brown spot. These, these four, I would say, are the most effective. So a lot of times people are saying, well, I've, I've got a fungicide program in place. Um, at least these top three, they also manage white mold. So if I'm using these, I should be covered. Well, they don't have any activity against late blight. And that's why we recommend if you're gonna use those, you tank mix with something that's like a chlorothalonil or a mancozip, a broad-based protectant fungicide. Biological-based fungicides, I have a, a big question mark here. There's a lot of them out there. You know, there's some data that say that some work, but Honestly, a lot of them don't. Um, we have seen some fail spectacularly in the field. And, and copper-based sprays, now they were the first, copper was the first fungicide that was pretty much ever used. And um, it is used in some places, uh, organic producers can use it, but um, it is somewhat toxic to handle and it's pretty weak when you stack it up against everything else. And so there are a lot of other things that you can use instead. This is a picture of, of a research trial that we have up in Bonners Ferry, Idaho. And in this place, uh, the late blight has come in naturally, but um, the person I work with there will actually put the late blight spores out right down here through the middle. So you get dead plants. And then this is an area where we did not treat. And this is one where we treated with a regular fungicide program. This is why I say that you know, as bad as late blight is, and as devastating as it can be, we can control it with the fungicides that we have. Timing is really important. I, I, I wanted to emphasize this. Uh, this is a shot from Southern Idaho in 2015. Um, this field had the, this whole field was sprayed exactly the same. This is just a single shot. 
Uh, this was late July. There was a rainstorm coming. And I can't remember why, but the sprayer who was working his way across the field, and he got to this point right here where my pointer is, and he had to stop and pull out. And then um, it rained that night. I think it took him two days to get back in the field. He started spraying again and, and worked this way. And that was the only difference. They had the same fungicides everywhere. But when you looked at the field about mid-August, there was a huge difference in the level of control. Getting the fungicide on before the rainstorm or before the, then the time was, was favorable um, made all the difference in the world. Now, I mentioned um, early blight and white mold. And I just want to say a few words. And I'll end on this idea, Nick, because I don't want to go over my time by too much. But um, in southern Idaho, and I, I believe it's probably going to be the same for many areas in Utah, we have found that um, sp spraying for early blight and white mold it really is best done on a, a, a calendar. We say it's a calendar based program, but it's like more of a phenology based program. If I start right about the time of row closure, and I make an application. Here I have Luna Tranquility with Bravo. Um, and I come back um, two weeks later and spray again. Then two weeks later, I spray with that protectant fungicide. And, and finally, two weeks after that, I spray again. So I have four applications. I get a significant reduction in the amount of late blight. Now, I, I mentioned earlier Luna Tranquility, Miravis Prime. Um, here's Endura with that Provisol. Really good control of early blight. There's almost none there. If we look at these same programs with the amount of white mold that we have, we get really good control of white mold. Nice thing about it, because I have this chlorothalonil in here in all of these pro in all of these programs, I also have protection built in for late blight. And we didn't have late blight in the field, so I couldn't do uh, measure data on that. One disease that some people will talk about is black dot. And quite honestly, we found that black dot is pretty much a non-factor. It's common, it shows up in fields, but it's really more of a disease of senescence. And, and I don't think it's worth treating for. Um, and as you look at it, the fungicides don't really do that good of a job at cutting it down. You might look at, well, it looks like the Miravis Prime program reduced it a little bit, but I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Now, why do we do this? The reason we do is because um, we want to get better yields. And we have found that when we control early blight, almost always, we're good for at least 20 to 30 sack increase, say on a, on a 630 sack yield. And so um, anyway, that's why we do it, by, by keeping out the early blight and why we, we can improve yield. Now we have a question here you mentioned earlier, low fertility and early blight go hand in hand. Have you looked at in foliar application with a fungicide? So is this, are you referring, I wonder if you're referring to a foliar application of fertilizers, perhaps. Um, Taylor, if you could uh, maybe type that in. I will say this, research was done, yeah, fertilizer. So research was done looking at fertilizer to suppress early blight. And this was, I think, done in Pennsylvania. And they found that they could, they could fertilize the crop to the point where they never had to use fungicides and they could complete, keep the early blight completely out. But the problem was at that level, they, they were, we were looking at nitrogen fertilizer. That was suppressing the maturation crop. So what happened is the yields were suppressed. So they found it's better to, to go with optimal fertilizer for the crop need and then rely on the fungicides to keep the disease out. And so using the, I mean, keeping optimal fertilizer is going to lower the, the early blight uh, risk, but you may still have some. And I'd say really with early blight, the spores don't move huge distances. If you've had a problem in a certain field in the past, that's a good indication you may have it in the future, um, or if you have a certain variety. Um, but um, yeah, you, you can't rely on the fertilizer alone. So with that, I think I am out of time. And so... Um, I don't know, Nick, you want me to send it back to you? I had a few more slides, but we don't have to go over those to, to keep us on schedule. If you want to go over them, that's fine. Okay. Um, oh, someone asked, are heirloom potatoes more susceptible to disease? But I wish I knew. I, um, I have not looked into that. And so I, I do not know. Um, I will say that a lot of the commercial varieties that have been released, especially the russet varieties that are common here in the West, a lot of times they have focused on trying to integrate some level of disease resistance. Um, a lot of times it's verticillium wilt resistance, like say with Ranger Russet or Alturus, um, some of the newer, relatively newer varieties. Um, and I don't, I don't know if the heirlooms would have had that same level of resistance incorporated into them, um, but they may also have some other genes that make them naturally resistant to certain diseases. So um, 
That's a long way of saying, I don't know. So I'm sorry, Julie, I can't answer that like I, I wish I could. Um, I will close on this thought. I, some of the soil-borne diseases that we see in season, I mentioned verticillium wilt, pink rot, powdery scab, and common scab, those are all things that can show up as the potatoes come out of the field. Um, pythium leak. This is, leak and pink rot are, are too, often two diseases that we see, especially if the soil has been kept waterlogged. One difference is leak will infect usually through an eye or a lenticel, and pink rot will often come in at the point of stolen attachment. That's not always the case, but it, it is a good general rule. If you cut them open, the leak tuber will look kind of a darkish um, brown, even to maybe a light gray, and it is soft. The way the disease gets its name is if you were to squeeze that, the water would just run out of it. Um, I have a cool video. My wife doesn't let me to show it because she says it's really gross. But um, the pink rot, it is a solid. It, it looks, the, here it doesn't look pink. It looks kind of like a maybe an off-white, a cream white, or a, even almost a yellow. Um, it will turn pink when it sits in air for a while. And there's a lot of things that you can do for pink rot management. Um, we found that um, the longer you can, you can uh, stretch out potatoes, you know, the longer the rotation, the less disease you have. If you have a low pH soil, you're at risk to have more pink rot. Um, if you're using a fungicide, especially to say the phosphites, you need to have at least 12 hours between when you apply to when you water because uh, the irrigation water can wash some of that off the leaves so the plant isn't able to absorb it. And it's important to start your fungicides um, if you're using, say, uh, something that's active against pink rot at either um, tuber initiation or up to row closure. If you start later than that, it's not going to work. Um, I'll just say something about pythium leak. It can be a problem. Here's, here's a different photo of that up here. We have found just the, the research is pretty amazing. When you dig potatoes, the pulp temperature goes a long ways in determining how susceptible the diseases are going to be, uh, the tuber to disease, um, and as does wounding. So if I wound my potatoes, it doesn't matter so much what the pulp temperature is, but if I can avoid wounding and keep the pulp temperatures down to 60, I can almost eliminate leak development and storage, but uh, at 70 degrees, I may have quite a bit. And so I, that's kind of the, uh, a quick overview and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or if there's something you want me to talk about more, you can email me and I'd be happy to, to correspond that way. But um, because that, Nick, that's what I had prepared. That's awesome. And for all you Utah growers out there, we actually are working on our um, a vegetable disease list. So if you guys go to our website and download that, we have the potato section and we got a whole boatload of diseases for you. So it's kind of like a bingo card. You can try to find all these diseases in your plants not that you want to. And then also if you reference our Utah vegetable production and pest management guide, if you go to our potato chapter, we actually have all the products that are, so a lot of the products that um, Dr. Miller was referencing, you can legally use those here in Utah too. So if you go to our fungicide tables um, in this book, you can reference the disease and then active ingredient and then all the products. So again, thank you, Dr. Miller. So now we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about, oh, can I have you, Dr. Miller, can I have you make me a host now? You bet. Now you're really gonna so, test my abilities here. So above my picture, the top right three blue dots, if yep. you click that, you can make host. Okay, you are there. Awesome. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna switch gears and we are gonna talk about common, okay, we're gonna talk about common insect pests of potato crops that we see here in Utah. So um, I'm just gonna cover a few that you might come across in your potato pr production and we'll be highlighting some of the more common pests that our growers see. So, Everyone knows this one. This is the infamous Colorado potato beetle. It's a major um, potato pest throughout all of North America. The adults, they become active in the springtime. And that's about the same time as the potato plants are emerging from the ground. 
And looking at that picture, you can see they're oval in shape, about three eighths of an inch long. And they have this yellow orange prothorax. That's that big area behind its head. And then they have yellow white wings with 10 narrow black stripes. So they're pretty easy to identify. And then the females, they'll lay um, clusters of bright yellow orange eggs on the undersides of the potato leaves. And then the larvae, when they're young and they first hatch, they are bright, kind of a bright brick red and, they're, and they have black heads. But as they grow older, they'll become more of a pink to salmon color with the black heads. And then all larvae, they have these two rows of black spots on the sides of their bodies. So that's another distinguishing characteristic. And then each adult female can lay up to 350 eggs during her life, which can last several weeks. And the larvae, they'll cluster near the egg masses when they're young, but then they'll begin to move throughout the plant and cause defoliation. So if you look in this top right photo, this is some pretty severe unmanaged defoliation by these beetles. And usually that fourth instar or the fourth life stage of the larvae, they'll drop down to the soil and they'll burrow into the soil to become to pupate into the adult stage. And then statistically, I think it's the oldest larvae, that fourth instar, they're pretty much responsible for about 75% of the feeding damage you see, again, like in that photo. And then our potato crops, they can usually tolerate up to 30% of defoliation when they're in that vegetative stage. So when we manage them, I'll throw this out if you are a home gardener and you just have a few plants, I'd say just go out there, pick them off and put them in some soapy water. That's probably the best form of pest control out there. But again, if you're a larger operation, you got that whole field, you can't do that. So there's also some natural enemies such as the assassin bug. I found a cool photo online of an assassin bug um, getting ready to devour potato beetle larva. And then we have damsel bugs and big eye bugs. But unfortunately, these natural enemies, they can have little impact on overall Colorado Colorado potato beetle numbers just because they are um, generalist predators and eat a lot of other bugs out there. But for you commercial growers, I would say pesticides are probably one of the more practical option. However, Colorado potato beetles, they've become over the decades, they've become resistant to a lot of synthetic pesticides like Harborel, Cypermethrin, Delta methrin, and pyrethrins, and a lot more. But there are some active ingredients or products that have the active ingredients um, as a duragactin, which is a type of neem oil. And then there's spinazad, which is made up of a soil bacterium. Those are pretty effective. So we'll, we usually suggest that for our commercial growers. And then on this chart too, I listed some that are registered for use here in Utah. So next we have aphids. Aphids. There are over 250 species of aphids, and they are that are considered um, pests to agronomic and ornamental crops. And as you might know, aphids are pear-shaped. They have soft. They're soft-bodied insects that suck plant that suck sap from the plant tissues, and they're no, they're pretty small. They're no bigger than five millimeters. And they have the notable tail, tailpipe-like appendages called cornicles on their rear end. So you can see that in this photo. Um, the color and texture can vary between space, species. So on our potato crop specifically, we see a lot of the green peach aphids. And then we have potato aphids as well. Green peach aphids are very common in Utah. And they're actually the ones that vector a lot of the viruses. That, um, that we see, such as the potato leaf roll virus and then potato virus Y. And they overwinter on their woody hosts in the prunus genus. So our peach, apricots, and plums. And then we have potato aphids. And they can actually, if you look on this right photo, they can be a pink form or a green form. And these ones are also very common in Utah, and they can also vector the potato virus Y and cucumber mosaic virus. 
and their woody hosts are roses. And like I said, the damage they do is just primarily feeding and sucking those um, sap out of the plant tissues. So you can see in this photo, we call this like an aphid hole where there's just a big influx of the population that killed off these potatoes. And then down here, you can see this one individual plant that got hit hard. So most um, aphids in vegetable crops have similar life cycles. They'll overwinter as the egg on their woody host. So like trees or shrubs. And then the eggs hatches all females in the spring. And then the adults will reproduce asexually throughout the summer. And then eventually they'll migrate back to their overwintering sites. And then aphids can contaminate plant parts, leaving them unmarketable. That's not so much a problem with our potato foliage. And like I said, they'll vector viruses. And that's usually our main concern with aphids. So cutworms. So I listed a few, I listed five examples of cutworm species that we might see here in Utah, the variegated black, western pale, glassy, and black. Oh, it looks like I listed black twice. So there's just four <laughs> I'll mention, but they kind of, I'll we'll talk about them as one, just cause they're all the same pretty much. The adults are moths and they're brown or dark gray with those front wings that have the irregular bands or spots. And then the wings will range from about one and a quarter to one and a half inches long when they're spread out. The eggs are extremely small. They're like spear shaped and they're white. And then the larvae, which is the damaging stage of this insect, those can range from a dull gray to a brown caterpillars and they can have stripes or spots and they can get up to two inches long when they're full grown. And most cutworms, they'll curl into a C shape when you like poke at them or they're disturbed. And then they'll pupate in the soil. However, cutworms, they overwinter as the larvae stage in the soil or underneath plant debris. And then in the spring, sometimes as early as January, if we have a mild winter, the larvae will become active again and then they'll feed on the roots and plant stems, including our young potato plants. So to manage them, if you're a smaller grower, or sorry, if you're a larger grower, you want to keep your area's crop weed, especially from grassy, or sorry, you want to keep your crop area weed free, especially from grassy type weeds, because those serve as an alternate host for cutworms. And then we also recommend tilling in the fall to kill that overwintering larvae stage. And then um, focus on fields with an early season weed infestation. And those are that are planted late because those are more susceptible to potato or to cutworms. And then if you um, are interested in trapping or monitoring, there are pheromone traps on the market for specifically black cutworms. And basically it's like a sticky trap and you put the pheromone in there and you can set those out in the field and that can help you monitor like when the moths are active. So we usually say a threshold of two black cutworm moths per trap per day that can um, indicate significant egg laying pressure. So during those times you wanna increase your field scouting efforts during crop emergence when the numbers meet those thresholds. And then lastly, we have insecticides. So some really effective organic products are BT and spinosad, and those work really well in all caterpillar species, especially the ones in the younger instars. And then of course I listed some other synthetic and organic products as well on this table. So next up we have potato silids. Um, if you look at this top left photo, the adults, they're less than one eighth of an inch long and they have clear wings and that kind of like rest is like a tent overneath its body, like you can see in this photo. And they're actually related to aphids and leafhoppers and they kind of look like small little cicada bugs and they're black with white markings. So you can see the two white stripes and then they have an inverted kind of a V shape. 
and we, they'll jump when they're disturbed or fly off. And then the eggs are extremely small, um, just larger than the potato leaf hairs. And they're about football, they're football shaped eggs, kind of orange to yellow in color. And they're supported individually by short stalks that are laid on the upper canopy of the potato plants and then on the undersides and edges of the leaves. So they're really hard to see, but they're there. And then the nymphs look dramatically different. So you can see in this bottom left photo and in the middle photo, they are flat, they're green and yellow, and they have these spooky red eyes. And they're kind of oval shaped with spines around their edges. So they're just really odd looking, but they're kind of cool. And they kind of almost resemble immature soft scale insects or kind of white fly young, but they, they're different because they'll move rapidly when they're disturbed. <clears throat> so potato silids, they do not overwinter here in northern Utah, but they will migrate north on air currents from warmer areas. Silid population dynamics and dispersal are greatly dependent on the temperature and the movement and dispersal increases at or above 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Adult potato silids vector the bacterium Let's see if I can pronounce this, Canadatus Liberacter solanersium. And that's actually the bacterium that causes zebra chip disease that we've had here in Utah before. And then zebra chip disease significantly impacts potato production. And again, it's spread by these guys. And then the adults and nymphs, they acquire the bacterium by feeding on an infected plant. And then they'll carry that bacteria bacterium with them the rest of their life. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of non-chemical control options for potato silids. We always recommend monitoring using these yellow sticky traps in the field and then visually inspecting for the leaves or the eggs on the nymphs, or sorry, look, inspecting the leaves for eggs and nymphs. And then if you've had potato silids that caused that zebra chip disease, or silid yellows, which is just kind of like yellowing of the leaves in the past few years, like on your site, um, then it's probably recommended, or it is, I would recommend to use that insecticide applications just to reduce the silid population, therefore reducing that zebra chip disease. And then here I've listed some synthetic and I think yep, we got some organic options. And these are all for registered for commercial use. So now we got the flea beetles, which we've talked about in this series before, but flea beetles, they are very common and they are very problematic here in Utah. You will find them in the late spring and early summer. The flea beetle adults typically range from about 1.7 to 4.2 millimeters long. And they have these cool enlarged um, femoral hind legs. So here's a picture I took a few months ago of a flea beetle. And you can see that hind leg, how much bigger it is. And this is what gives them the name flea beetle because they all jump like a flea when they're disturbed. And then the color depends on the species. So some that affect our potatoes I listed are the tobacco flea beetle, Western black flea beetle, and pale striped flea beetle. And most flea beetle species will overwinter as adults in protected areas. So that'll include like plant residue. In the spring, they will mate and they will lay their eggs at the soil base of desired host, host plants, including our potatoes. Eggs can then hatch into the larval stage, which lasts about a month and then um, those larvae will then pupate, allowing a second generation of flea beetles in the summertime. And then the damaging life stage is both the larva and the adults. But like you can see in this top left photo, um, the adults will chew holes or leave little pits in the foliage. And then the larva, they can actually cause a lot of damaged potatoes. They can reduce plant health by feeding on the roots and the fine root hairs, but this does not usually cause a whole lot of economic loss. But some species, um, such as the tuber flea beetle, those larvae will um, 
cause the olive like shallow winding grooves under the potato surface. So you can see in these photos and they can almost kind of like they're tunneling through it. And they'll leave um, frass, which is like the insect poop in there, which is gross. Like people aren't gonna wanna buy that. And the best way to monitor or the best way to monitor, monitor for them is to check the seedlings at least two or three times a week until they grow out of that vulnerable stage. And you can do that by visual inspections. You can take out, um, I call them like a beating tray and check for the flea beetles, or you could just monitor with the yellow sticky trap. Um, in mature plants, the treatment's usually not necessary unless the populations are crazy high and they're causing notable visual, visual damage. And there are some generalist predators, such as like the larvae of lacewing, adult big-eyed bugs, damsel bugs, and they'll feed on the adult flea beetles. And there's actually um, a specific parasitoid wasp too that will parasitize flea beetles. But again, I wouldn't fully rely on natural enemies, especially on like a large commercial production. There's just not gonna be enough of them to kick back that, those numbers. So although foliar application of insecticides is the most common management tactic for flea beetles, it should really only be used as necessary just because flea beetles are so mobile and hard to control. And since plants, plants, especially potato plants, produce that continuous new foliage growth, um, they can always like reinvade as well. But I did list some products that are available for use. So if you really have high numbers, that's always an option. Okay, so I wanna finish up on wireworms. And so the adult wireworms, we call them click beetles. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then the larvae stage is the damaging stage. So they look different. They look like worms, but they have like these kind of bright orange segments. And here in Utah, so far we've seen the Pacific Coast wireworm, the sugar beet wireworm, Western Field wireworm. Uh, sorry, I should call these click beetles because these are the adult stage. And then Columbia Basin click beetle, and then the Great Basin click beetle adult. And these adults, they're usually about a fourth to a half inch long. And we call them click beetles um, because they have a hard shell body on the back. And that's like a black to brown color, depending on the species. And they make like this distinctive clicking noise because they have like a hinge between their um, head or their thorax and abdomen. And I've actually like seen that myself. Like if you like scoop a bunch up and try to hold them, you can hear them like clicking and jumping around. So that's kind of cool. The eggs are small, round and white and they're laid singly or in clusters in moist soil or grassy areas. And the larvae, which is what we're gonna focus on because this is the damaging stage is about half to one and a half inch long when they're mature and they have that wiry look. And they can be shiny and white at first, but then they'll become light brown or kind of a straw colored as they age. And then the pupa, um, they, those are usually white and then they'll pupae in the soil. So the adults, they'll overwinter in the soil and they'll emerge in late April to early May here in Northern Utah. And the adult females, they can lay to 50 to 400 eggs in their lifetime in the soil, and they'll go about six inches deep. And then during the hot summer periods, the larva will move deeper into the soil. Um, wireworms are uncommon, but there have been a few cases in Utah. So the past two summers, um, I've personally been to a site where they've been really bad. And I keep going to that site every year because I know they're going to be there and the growers not <laughs> really managing them. So I'm interested to see, and this is down in Holiday, Utah, not to out them, but I'm going to keep going back to that site and just see how much that population spreads. And specifically in our potato crops, um, wireworms will feed on seeds in the roots of the young plants 
The larvae can cause severe damage to potato by creating tunnels in the tuber as they feed. And then infestations do not spread rapidly from one field to another because the click beetles are poor flyers. So managing is kind of a big challenge. So the best way to do it is just this inspect the soil surface for wireworms after plowing or disking a field. And that's really the only reason I found them because I saw the plants looked a little off and I was seeing those adults. So I had to like dig pretty deep into the soil to actually start seeing the wireworms. Um, so sanitation is a big thing. So you wanna remove dead plants and tubers throughout the season because wireworms typically damage um, in the mid-season. So I thought it was interesting how Dr. Miller said in Idaho, they have laws against having those big coal piles. So I'm not familiar with any Utah laws, but I'll have to look into that. But you should wanna get rid of those coal piles because they can just harbor all sorts of trouble. And then for wireworms, like we don't have big problems, like I said, in our commercial fields. But if that were the case, we would always recommend intensive plowing because they can be just overturned and reduced that way. And there are some resistant varieties. So I found this cool table. This is from, I think, Oregon State University where they list the variety of potato and then the percent infected. So the higher on the list, the more resistant they are to the wireworms. And I listed some, there's just not a whole lot of um, insecticide products for the adult beetles. I did list two, but again, they're just hard. I would just recommend those cultural controls for wireworms. So I'm gonna wrap it up there and I'm gonna talk about our USU Extension Utah Pest website. So if you guys have questions on anything about potatoes or anything, any other vegetable or fruit crops, this is a great resource. You can read more about our Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab where you can send samples of any problem potatoes you might have. We have a lot of educational how-to videos. We have some free guide eBooks, informative fact sheets, and then you can watch a lot of recorded webinar presentations on there as well. And then if you aren't already subscribed to our Utah Pest Advisories, these are timely email alerts on insects and diseases to look out for. So you can get those for vegetables, fruit, your turf and landscape plants. And then of course, like I was plugging earlier, we have the Utah vegetable production and pest management guide. So you can get the online version or you can get buy a hard copy at our USU extension store. And then my contact. So I'm going to look at some of these questions. Ooh, Anne asked a really good question. So Anne asked, are potato tuber moths an issue in Utah? So Anne, as of 2020, we think they are. If you live in Kane County, we did have a confirmed sample there. Um, we don't see a lot of it. I mean, it's, so far we've only seen it down in Kane County. So we're gonna monitor for it a lot this season. So keep posted on updates for that. So that's kind of a new and emerging pest. Um, Paulette asked, do wireworms affect other crops? Can a two or three year crop rotation starve them out? So yeah, Paulette, they can actually affect a lot of root crops as well. So our beets, carrots, and I think radishes and um, rotating them out with like grain crops. So small grains, corn can help reduce those populations. Um, so Rick asks, my garden potatoes tend to die early. What should I check for? So I think Rick, in general, you want to be looking out. I would go out there weekly, especially early in the season, start looking at signs or symptoms, we call them. So is there anything wrong with the foliage that you see? Do you see any insect pests? Do you see any disease symptoms? So that's kind of a general question. But if you want to keep your plants healthy for longer, 
I would just say early monitoring and staying on top of the problems. So lastly, if you want a pesticide use CEU from the Utah Department of Agriculture, you got to answer these four true or false questions and you need to email them to drewmatthews.gov. And I'll actually send you, if you've requested one, I'll send you an email tomorrow morning. So you'll have the same information. So with that said, do we have any other questions for myself or Dr. Miller? Okay, it doesn't look like it. So I think with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up again. Thank you, Dr. Miller for joining us here in Utah tonight. So Diane House asked, when should I put my seed potatoes in the ground? I think the old wife's tale is by Good Friday. I okay. say you just don't want you just don't want it to freeze after they've emerged from the soil. You know, they can handle good frost um, as long as they're below ground a few inches. But yeah, and Diane, check out this Utah Vegetable Production Pest Management Guide. Um, Dr. Dan Dross, you wrote a whole chapter on potatoes. And I think you'll have a lot of answers to your questions there. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and.